What you see behind me is the ancient city of Ephesus. In the first century, there was no greater or majestic city in all of Asia Minor than the city of Ephesus. In fact, in the Roman world, it was the second largest city, second only to Rome itself. It famously held the Temple to Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The gospel showed up here when the Apostle Paul made a quick trip in the spring of 52 AD with his friends Priscilla and Aquila. But he didn't stay long the first time, but he promised to return. And he kept that promise. A year, maybe two years later, Paul shows back up in Ephesus. And this time, he stayed to do ministry in this city for over three years. But he didn't just do ministry here in Ephesus. The ministry from Ephesus began to spread out and reach all over Western Asia Minor into cities like Colossae and Philadelphia and Sardis and Laodicea. Paul's ministry here in Ephesus made a huge impact all over Asia Minor, what we would call modern day Turkey, but not just for them, but also for us. There is no more important church in all of the New Testament than what we have recorded for us about the church of Ephesus. Obviously, we have the birth of the church in the book of Acts. We have Paul's letter to this church in what we call the book of Ephesians. We also have the letters of 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, which was given to Timothy, who is the pastor here in Ephesus. And we also have a letter from Jesus himself that is found in the book of Revelation written to the church in Ephesus. We have in our New Testament a window, a 40-year window of the beginning of the church of Ephesus. And in this window, in this one generation, we see a church that starts so well, but finds itself in very real danger in one generation. And as we, the Church of Quad City, embark to not just gather on Sundays and sing a few songs and check a spiritual box, but to make a lasting difference in the region that God has placed us in. The Church of Ephesus serves as both a warning and an encouragement. So we're gonna do a deep dive into the Church of Ephesus and look for examples that we should follow and some pitfalls that we should avoid as we seek to leave a kingdom footprint long after we're gone. Welcome to the rise and fall of the Church of Ephesus. Well, welcome. My name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here, and we are honored that you've chosen to start your week off by worshiping with us here at Quad City Christian Church. I want to welcome to those who are joining us online from whenever and wherever you are. So excited to have you, as well as all of those worshiping in Prescott Valley today. Welcome to you as well. Today is an exciting day for me because we are kicking off this brand new series, one that I've been looking forward to for a really long time. Um, if you're new with us, one of the core values of Quad City Christian is that we teach the Bible. If you're either here at the Prescott campus or out in Prescott Valley, you'll see a big placard that has our four core values. And one is we teach the Bible. And for us, one of the things that that means is that we do not want to just teach Bible topics, but we want to teach Bible texts, which is why if you uh, make this your church, you will find that the majority of the teaching that we do here isn't going to be just a topical message on a good theme. It is going to be us taking a book of the Bible or sometimes just a big chunk of Scripture and we're going to work our way through it line by line and verse by verse. And that's what we're going to be doing in this series that we're starting today. But we're not just going to take one book of the Bible. We're actually going to take three books of the Bible and then two parts of uh, two different books. So, 
Um, as you heard in this video, we're going to focus on the church in Ephesus. And there is no church in the Bible that has more written about it or written to it than the church of Ephesus. We get to see this church begin in the book of Acts, starting in chapter 18. We get to see a letter that Paul wrote to it that we call Ephesians. We have two letters that the Apostle Paul wrote to the pastor in Ephesus, Timothy. And then lastly, Jesus himself wrote a letter to it that we have in Revelation chapter 2. And in our New Testament, as I said in the video, we get to see this church start so well. We get to see it rise and thrive. And then we get to see a piece of its demise as Jesus warns, you are not going to be my church anymore unless you repent. So for those of us who want to see the church of Jesus thrive in our day. The story of this church in Ephesus is full of encouragements and warnings. We find examples of things that we should be doing and things that we shouldn't be doing. And so we're going to study everything that the New Testament has to teach us about the church in Ephesus, which means that we're going to spend Literally like a year learning from the church in Ephesus. And I couldn't be more excited. And I know I look at you and you're like, a year? Like, what do you care? You just show up on Sunday anyway. It doesn't matter what we're preaching. You're going to be here. It's fine. You'll be fine. It'll be great. Um, as you can see from the video, I actually got to go to Ephesus this past summer, go to Turkey and walk many of the places that we're going to be talking about in this series We've got lots of video that we're going to get to share and pictures that we're going to get to share. My hope is that some of that will be as in, uh, um, encouraging for you as it was for me. It really just helps to see the scriptures in 3D. And so hopefully you'll enjoy that. Now, we've been asked, are we going to do a booklet that goes along with this series? Because oftentimes when we do an exegetical book like this, we'll often do a book that goes along with it. And the answer to that is no. Uh, we did some straw polling and come to find out most of you all get really excited about the book at the beginning and then it lays on your coffee side table or in the back of your truck. And it never gets used. You take it and uh, I have good intentions, but it never actually get utilized. And so that's a lot of money and time. And so we decided we won't do that. But we did create some journals uh, that look like this that are branded because the majority of you use your booklets for taking sermon notes. And so that's what we created these for. Got some bad news for you. We ran out already. So check back next week. All right. But today we're going to dive in to this series. And I want, I want to begin this series just by laying the land. All right, I want to give an intro so that we can feel ourselves in the city of Ephesus as we begin this journey together. Uh, how many of you, like me, are a visual learner? How many visual learners we got? Oh, that's so good. That does my soul good. Well, you're going to love today because we got maps. We got maps today. Anybody got a map in the back of the Bible? You can bring, you can bust that thing out today. You've never been invited to open your map in church. Today's the day, Okay. Today, I want to show you this map, okay? So we're going to keep coming back to this. This map is the primary region of which Paul did his ministry, which also means this is the primary region that the whole New Testament took place in. From Jerusalem down here in the east to Rome up here in the west, so this is Paul's ministry. This is the ministry of most of the New Testament. Paul began here and he worked his way west all the way to Rome, okay? And he hit almost every major city in between, including right here in the middle, the city of Ephesus. Now, Ephesus is in what we would call today modern day Turkey. So if you were to pull out your Google Maps, this whole area is called Turkey today, in your New Testament, it's referred to as the region of Asia Minor. And Ephesus is the most important city in Asia Minor. It was the capital city. And it was a rich city. 
We toured the first century, some first century houses there that are built on the hillside there in Ephesus. And in these first century houses, these houses had indoor plumbing with both hot and cold water all the way back in the first century. Like my, I grew up in Kentucky. My mother literally had to go to the bathroom in an outhouse in the 60s. Like we didn't have indoor plumbing then, all right? And out in front of this neighborhood of hillside houses, there's literally a road that is made of mosaic. Like this, is, this isn't on the inside, this is the outside. Like that's another kind of wealth. It's one thing for you to have a mosaic in your bathroom. Imagine your sidewalk on your main road of your HOA having mosaic. Like that's what we're looking at here. Like that's a whole nother level of rich. And the reason it was so rich is because Ephesus was a commercial center in its day. It had a harbor, okay? In fact, this, this street right here is called Harbor Street because, and it's hard to see in your map or on the picture, I'm sorry, but if you look back here in the distance, there's this kind of mossy green flat area. Back in Paul's day, that was underwater, That was the harbor. The harbor literally came up to this harbor street. Now, over the centuries, that harbor has got silted in with mud, and so the water is further back from the city at this point. But in in Paul's day, this, this harbor came right up to this street, and people would bring boatloads of goods from all over the world right into Ephesus. They would unload them. And this area right here that you see is what's called an agora. It's a first century marketplace. You just bring your goods right up this street and right into the marketplace for the whole world to buy your stuff. And so Ephesus was rich. And it was famous. It was famous because it was the home of the goddess uh, Artemis' temple. And her temple, the temple of Artemis, was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. People came from all over to worship in Ephesus at her temple. And we'll talk about that a little more in the weeks to come. Here in Ephesus... We find the largest theater in all of Asia Minor. It set 24,000 people in this theater. It also had a little smaller theater called an Odeon, which set about 1,400 people. And as you walk through the city, you will find that there are statues and fountains dedicated and, and temples dedicated to the emperors of Trajan and Domitian and Hadrian. And these emperors, the temples for these uh, emperors made life really difficult for the first few generations of Christians living in Ephesus. You can find this one. This was a, the Deme, uh, Domitian's temple. It was a big two-story affair. And then you had this one. This was Hadrian's temple there in Ephesus. And these are emperors over the Roman Empire, and they would build these temples in dedication to them. But here's the problem. These emperors did not consider themselves just as rulers to be respected. They saw themselves as gods to be worshipped. And they had no problem if you would worship other gods. It was a polytheistic culture. You could worship other gods, but they had to be first. Your first allegiance was to Caesar as Lord. Which meant when you claimed Jesus is Lord, it put you at odds with the Roman government. Which made the life of the first few generations of Jesus followers really, really difficult here. Ephesus was seen as the second greatest city in all of the Roman Empire, second only to Rome itself. Which means... If we could get the gospel to take root in a city like Ephesus, with all of its power and might and riches and influence, we can change a big swath of the world. And that's exactly what Paul determined to do. 
We're going to pick up the story in Acts chapter 18. So if you have your Bibles, turn them on or turn them to Acts 18. Now, the second half of the book of Acts is primarily the ministry of the apostle Paul. Paul came to faith in about 33 AD, about three years after the resurrection of Jesus. And and in the three years following, Paul had the gospel downloaded to him by Jesus himself. Like Jesus discipled the apostle Paul. I don't know how that worked, but that's Paul's testimony. That for three years, Jesus discipled Paul one-on-one. Then Paul kind of kind of went off the beaten path for about 10 years, hiding out in his hometown of Tarshish, until a young man named Barnabas says, that guy has some horsepower, power. we need to go find Paul. And Barnabas takes off to go find Paul and bring him into the ministry. And he brought Paul to a city called Antioch, in, in what we call today Syria, just north of Israel. And it was from Antioch that Paul and Barnabas were first sent out with the gospel to go all around the Mediterranean Sea around 48 AD. So Paul had been living in Tarsus. This is where he's from. Barnabas was here in Antioch. And he goes to Tarsus to get Paul and brings him back to Antioch. And it was from there that Paul began his ministry to take the gospel all the way around, and he went to cities like Derby and Iconium and Lystra. He goes into northern Asia Minor, ends up in Troas, and takes a boat over to Macedonia, to places like Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea, and he continues on all the way down to the city of Corinth. And this is where we're going to pick up the story today. Acts chapter 18. Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Crenshia because of a vow that he had taken. So Paul is in Corinth, and he'd stayed there for quite a while, about two years, 18 months to two years. So Paul was there and he decides he needs to go back to his hometown in Antioch in Syria. So so Paul goes and he begins to make the trip. But as Paul often does, when he finds people, he will take them on his travels with him. You will almost never find Paul traveling alone. And while he was in Corinth, he gets connected to two people, Priscilla and Aquila. And they, like Paul, are tent makers. Like literally they make tents out of goats. Like that's what they do for their job. And Paul met these people. They're blue-collared workers. But Paul doesn't just see a bunch of blue-collar workers. He sees kingdom-minded people who loved the Lord and knew his word. And Paul says, I could use people like you. And so they traveled with Paul. And they get on a boat. And Paul, before he gets on the boat here in Crenshia, he shaves his head, as all good holy men do. (laughs) He shaves his head because of a vow that he had taken. And so, Priscilla, Aquila, and a bald-headed Paul start sailing toward uh, Syria, back to uh, whatever that is, Antioch. There it is. But just like so many cross country trips, there is a bit of a layover. They arrived at Ephesus, where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined. But as he left, He promised, I will come back if it is God's will. And then he set sail from Ephesus. So Paul was in 
Corinth, and he's got to get to Antioch, but just like all of your flights, you never have a direct flight. He has to go through, and they stop at Ephesus, and that's where they get all of their supplies, and it takes a little longer than it does for your Royal Caribbean cruise line to restock. And so Paul takes advantage of being in Ephesus. He goes into the synagogue, begins preaching the gospel, and the people there are interested. They aren't converting yet, but they're like, I'm not sure what you're saying, but, I, but I'd like to hear more. Would you mind staying with us and sharing the gospels even longer? And he says, I can't, I can't do that. I got to get back. But if it's God's will, I will come back. I'll come back to be with you here in Ephesus. And so Paul gets on the ship from Ephesus and starts making his way to, to uh, Syria, but he leaves Priscilla and Aquila in Ephesus. When he landed, when Paul landed at Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. So he l went from Corinth over to Ephesus, and now he's heading, and he has to fly into Caesarea. That's where the next big boat lands. And the text says he gets to Caesarea, and he goes up to Jerusalem and down to Antioch. You look like, wait, did Luke have his map upside down? Like Luke is the one recording this for us. Did he get that right? And the answer is yes. Because when Luke is thinking about these travels, he's not thinking about them as north, south, east, and west. He's thinking about these travels as somebody who's walking. Like you're not taking a car or a bus to Jerusalem from Caesarea and all the way up to Antioch. You're walking. How many of you all are hikers? Anybody got any hikers? You weirdos. You know, you, we are mountain people here. You understand what it means to go up when you're walking. All you have to do is ask your quads. And here's the thing. Jerusalem is on a mountain. It doesn't matter which direction you come from. You always go up to Jerusalem. And it doesn't matter which way you leave. You are always going down from Jerusalem. It has both physical properties and spiritual properties. Jerusalem is seen as the pinnacle. The holy temple on the mount is the pinnacle. You always go up to Jerusalem and you always go down from Jerusalem. And so Paul, when visited the church in Jerusalem and then made his way back to Antioch, after spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there and traveled from place to place through the region of Galatia and Phygria, strengthening all the disciples. So he's in Antioch, and he goes back across the terrain that he went the first time. And he travels through Galatia and Phygria. Phygria is kind of a region right in this general area. And he begins visiting, revisiting these churches that he had started when he first began preaching the gospel some five years before. And we don't know how long Paul had stayed in Antioch. It was probably less than a year, but then he's off again. And while Paul is... Meandering around Galatia, Luke takes us back to Ephesus. This is like a scene change in an 80s TV show. Luke says, meanwhile, back at the ranch, meanwhile, while Paul's doing his little business in Galatia, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man. Though, I'm sorry, with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. So this is our introduction to Apollos. And here's what we know about him. He is from Alexandria. Alexandria is right down here in northern Egypt. And so while Paul is doing his thing in Antioch and Galatia, 
Apollos has made his way from Alexandria up to Ephesus. And we're told that he is a learned man, which should not surprise us if he is from Alexandria. Alexandria is a, a intellectual academic mecca. If you are a fan of the early church fathers, Alexandria is really important. It is the home of great men of faith like Philo, Obviously, Clement of Alexandria, as well as Origen. These are great men of the faith, and they all come from Alexandria. It had the largest library in the ancient world. It was an academic epicenter, so it shouldn't surprise us that Apollos from Alexandria was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of Scripture, primarily the Old Testament Scripture. We're just now writing the New Testament, okay? He's... A he knows the word of God. He had been instructed, Apollos had been instructed in the way of the Lord. And he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. This is an important piece. We'll come back to that in a minute. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. So don't miss this. Paul had first come to Ephesus, spoke in the synagogue, shared the gospel, didn't stay long. Paul leaves, Priscilla and Aquila stay behind. And while Paul is gone, Apollos comes to town, and like Paul, Apollos is an evangelist. He goes into the synagogue, he preaches the way of Jesus, and he shares it with great fervor. The text says he taught about Jesus accurately. He knew Jesus, but somewhere along the way, he missed something. What he missed was the baptism of Jesus. He only knew the baptism of John. And we'll talk about the, the distinction between those Next week, but Jesus was taught by Apollos, but he got the baptism piece wrong. And look at what it says. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they're listening to Apollos teach. They realize he's missing something. There's some gaps in his understanding of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And so they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. And I love that. And as we kick off this series, we're kicking this series off to discover what does it take to build and maintain a great church that will long outlive all of us. And to do that, there's a hugely important lesson right here in this moment. If you're a note taker, here it is. To build a great church the tent makers are just as important as the theologians. Like, don't miss this. Like, this great, learned, knows the word of God, this evangelist comes to town. He is a great orator. He has charisma. He's really smart. But here's what we all know. No matter how learned you are, there's always more to learn. And who did this great learned man, Apollos, learn from? Priscilla and Aquila. He learned from the tent makers what it means to follow God. Here's the thing. There are some of you, and you've been following Jesus for a really long time. And you know him, and you love him, and you have wisdom and experience that goes beyond what a lot of pastors even have. And here's what you need to know. The church needs you to share that wisdom and experience. The church needs you, the pastors need you to share that wisdom. Now, it's important to do that in an honoring way. Notice that when they heard Apollos and they realized he doesn't have this completely right, they did not stand up in the middle of church and say, you're wrong, pastor, and then march out. They didn't do that. Instead, they listened 
And then the text says they took him aside. They invited them, him into their home. They had him over for dinner and they opened their Bibles and they taught him the word of God more fully. Here's the thing I want you to hear from me. I'm only going to say this once. And I need you to refrain from being shocked, okay? I don't know it all. I ask you to refrain. (laughs) I don't know it all. And I know there are things that I still have to learn. And one of the things that I try to encourage in our team is a willingness to learn. To actually being open to hearing a different viewpoint to having people challenge our suppositions. I want to be open to hearing other people's understanding of the word of God. And I welcome you to have those conversations with me. However, when you do, you need to come at me with the word of God. Don't come to me with your opinions. I don't care about your opinions. And neither should you care about my opinions. The only thing that matters is what does the word of God say? And if there's something that you've seen in the word of God that I've missed, if there's some understanding that you've come to from the word of God that I have neglected, then please, please, please share that with me. I don't want to be any dumber than I have to be. Like Apollos, I want to be open to learning from anyone even those I'm preaching to. Acts 18 ends like this. When Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed, for he vigorously refuted the Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. We don't know how long Apollos was in Ephesus, but He wasn't there evidently very long, probably less than a year, and he gets a sense that he's being called to get on a boat and head over to Achaia, which is where Corinth is. And so the people in Ephesus, they write a letter affirming this man is a man of God and he understands the gospel and he wants to leverage his life for ministry. You should use him in Corinth. He'll be a blessing. And he was, and he went over and he did what every good evangelist should do. He opens up the word and he proves from the word that Jesus is the Messiah. And we'll pick back up in the text there next week. But as we kind of shift away from Apollos, I want want to share just a couple of more takeaways from our friend Apollos. And here they are. You don't have to know everything to be a part of great kingdom work. Again, there are some of you, and you have been in and around church your whole life. You've heard more sermons than than you need in three lifetimes. You've been in more Bible studies than you can even remember. You've read the Bible from cover to cover, some of you multiple times. And yet, if I ask you today to come up here and share the truth of the word of God before us today, or take this person and disciple them into following Jesus, you would break out in a cold sweat and you would say, I can't do that. I don't know enough. And here's the truth. Here's the truth. You know more than many. Thus, you have something worth teaching. You know more than many. Thus, you have something worth teaching. Apollos didn't know it all. He had some holes in his understanding, and yet he went out and he taught with great fervor. You don't have to know everything to share something. You don't have to know everything to share something. And the good news is if you get it wrong, the church is full of gracious people like Priscilla and Aquila who will wrap you up, bring you in and say, let me help you understand a few things that you may not have understood. 
We have to get past this mindset that we have to know everything to share anything. It's just not true. Now, on the flip side, here's another takeaway. No matter how learned you are, there's always more to learn. I've already shared with you that I am eager to receive help from you wherever it is that I've got something from the word wrong. Here's the question. Are you as eager to hear from me when there is something in Scripture that you may have gotten wrong? Because here's what I know. I'm in my 17th year here at Quad City. And there are dozens, maybe up into the triple digits at this point, of people who have heard me teach something that goes against something that they have always believed. And without ever giving me a chance to sit down and explain to them from the scripture the reason I believe it, they just walk away and they go find someone who will never challenge anything they believe. It is as if they already know everything that there is to know and their viewpoint is perfect. And anything that would fall outside of what they have already come to believe must be wrong. But what Apollos teaches us is, no matter how learned you are, there's always more to learn. So here's the question. Are you open to hearing that something you have believed may actually be wrong? Here's the third one. The birth of the church of Ephesus teaches us that the church is sustained not by the people in the front, but by the people in the back. Or we could say it this way, the church of God is sustained not just by the people on the platform, but by the people in the pews. Think about this, the launch of this church. Paul shows up and he stays a couple of days and then he's gone. And Apollos eventually shows up and stays for less than a year, and then he's gone. And who is it that was there the whole time providing the foundation for the church in Ephesus? Priscilla and Aquila. It was the tent makers. To build a great church... The tent makers and the mechanics, the con contractors and the school administrators, the restauranteurs and the theologians are all needed. They all have a place, which means you matter here. Your ministry here matters. Your relationships here matters. Your faithful service matters. Your generosity matters. Your influence matters. Your spiritual insight matters. Your leadership matters. The truth is the people on the stage, they will come and they will go. It's happened at this church for over a hundred years. What makes the church great is the faithful followers of Jesus who show up week in and week out and they give and they serve and they love and they leverage their lives to make more and better disciples. It's the blue collar everyday Christian who says, I'll work a job and I'll spend my life to help people know Jesus. And I'm just, I'm just thinking, that as we embark on this journey to say, what is it going to look like for us to build the type of church here in the Quad Cities that's going to outlast us all? It's going to take people, not just me, not just people up here. It's going to take people like you who see building the kingdom as worthy of laying down your life. And I hope you see building the church as something worth giving your life to.
Let me pray. Father, we are grateful for the story of this church that you preserved for us, that we can learn from. There's so many great lessons, and I pray that you'd reveal them to us. And may it not just be knowledge for our head, but may there be action steps for our feet that we are willing to go put into practice what you reveal to us. May we, the church in the Quad City of Arizona, build something great that long lasts after we're gone. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen.